Good day everyone, welcome back for another lesson. Today we're going to talk again about the periodic table, but we will focus on families, atomic, the atomic number and the atomic mass. So let's see what else the periodic table has to offer. Okay, so when I talk about families, I'm talking about specific groups. So we said that groups are basically the columns in the periodic table. Now there are four groups and I've identified them with my two uh, red rectangles. There are four groups that we also call families because these groups have special properties that um, are either fairly common or have been studied a lot or are very useful uh, in the everyday life. So I will talk about those uh, four specific families and their properties. The first one is called the, al they are called the alkali metals. The name says it, they are metals. So that means hydrogen is not really part of that family. We know it's part of this group because it has one valence electron, but it's not exactly part of the family. It doesn't have the same properties as these metals in orange. So the alkali metals will be the first family I will talk about. The second one, the second family is called, uh, are called, I should say, the alkaline earth metals. So these are the alkaline earth metals, group number two. Group number seven, this family contains the halogens. And the last one, which is group eight, this family contains the inert gases or rare gases or noble gases. So they have three names, but I'd rather call them the inert gases and I'll explain to you why in a few moments. So let's begin with their properties. So the first group called alkali metals. So as I said, it's group 1A or 1, and that's exception made of hydrogen. This group has the following properties. All of these elements are soft. And when I say soft, we can cut through them like uh, butter. So we could take a knife and cut through them. They're very light, so in other words, not heavy. They have a low melting point. They are excellent conductors of heat and electricity. They are highly reactive. This is probably one of the most important characteristics that they have. They're very, very, very reactive and they react with humidity, so with water. So they must be stored in oil. Because you will see they react to different degrees. So if we take, for example, uh, sodium or lithium, they will, if you drop them in water, create a little bit of a flame. So they're very energetic and they create light essentially. When you go down the family, these become more and more and more reactive, practically to the point that they're explosive when they are in contact with water. So because of that, they need to be stored in oil to avoid them being in contact with water or humidity. In nature, we find them in compounds. So they're not found in the, their elemental state. So in other words, they're not found as a standalone. They form compounds with the halogens, group seven, and when they react with halogens, they form salts. So salts are a big uh, family of chemical compounds. We know table salt, NaCl or sodium chloride, but there are many more salts that uh, exist and that we sometimes use in the everyday life. Think of the uh, winter that's coming. Uh, we will probably be putting a mixture of salt and gravel on the streets. So, or the city will. So these salts are not the same as table salt. It's a different type of salt. We use that to our advantage, depending on the situation. Okay, next, group number two, we have the alkaline earth metals. So group 2A or 2. These are slightly harder than the alkali metals, but they're still malleable. So in other words, we can still bend them and they will not break. They're all gray, so they all have the same color. They have a slightly higher melting point than the alkali metals. They are excellent conductors as well. They still react violently, but a little less violently than the alkali metals. And just as a sidebar, why is it that they react less violently? Well, they're part of group 2A. So if you recall, that means they have two valence electrons, as opposed to alkaline earth, uh, alkali metals, sorry, are part of group 1a, so they have one valence electron. So they only need to drop one valence electron to be stable, 
the alkaline metals do. The alkaline earth metals need to drop or give away two valence electrons to become stable. This takes more time, so because of that, they won't react as quickly as the other group. And because of that, they are a little bit, they react a little less violently when in contact with water. In nature, uh, we often find them as compounds in the form of rocks. And they also form compounds with group 7 called halogens, and they form, again, uh, different types of salts. Group 7, 7A or 17, those are called the halogens. Uh, one important characteristic is that they are colored, so they really have various colors. It could be green, it could be yellow, uh, and so on and so forth, so they have their own characteristic color. They react easily with alkaline metals as well as alkaline earth metals, as I just said, to form salts. They also react with hydrogen to form acids. One of the most common one would be hydrochloric acid. So hydrogen reacts with chlorine, which is a halogen, to create hydrochloric acid. So that's a very important point or characteristic of halogens. Another one that's very important uh, is that they are toxic, corrosive, and bactericidal. So they kill bacteria and microorganisms. Think of chlorine in water. So we put that in pools in order to kill microorganisms that would make us sick. So again, halogens are toxic, corrosive, and bactericidal, another important characteristic that they have. The last group, so column number 8A or 18, they're called noble gases, rare gases, or inert gases. I said before I like to call them inert gases. The word inert means non-reactive, and that really is what defines them the best. They do not react chemically. They don't like to be part of a reaction because their last shell is already full. That's why they are positioned in column number eight. They have eight valence electrons, and we know because of the octet rule, that means they do not need to gain or lose electrons. They're happy the way they are, making them non-reactive or inert. So, some characteristics. They are colorless, just like air. Air is a mixture, but still we can't see air. The same way we cannot see these inner gases. They are very stable. I think by now you understand this is a super important characteristic that they have, so they don't really react. I said minimal reactivity, but it's basically more or less no reactivity. Now, one way that we can make them quote-unquote react, they won't react with another substance, but if we do zap them with electricity, they will emit color. What happens is their electrons get excited, they jump from one orbit to another, or they leave and they come back. And by doing so, they emit light, which is colored. Now, in a subsequent video, I will explain the quantum theory a little bit more, but that's, in summary, what they do. And if you think of neon lights, right, they are colored. And that is because those gases, as I said, when subjected to electricity, will emit light, colored light. So each gas has its own typical color. So some will be green, some will be red and purple and whatnot. And by mixing them, we can obtain even more colors. So we call these neon lights because, you know, one of the gases, neon in column eight, is an inert gas. And I'm guessing, I did not research this, but I'm guessing it's probably either uh, one of the most prevalent gases in neon lights, or originally anyways, or maybe it was the first one to be used and therefore neon lights were named after that specific inner gas. So if you're interested, maybe you could look it up. But um, that's a story there. And finally, because they are not reactive, we will find them in their elemental state. In other words, they remain as elements, they do not react, they do not form compounds with other substances. Now, moving on to another aspect of the periodic table. Uh, when we look at, a, at the periodic table, we have a bunch of little squares like this with some information inside. And this information is very, very, very important. So let's take a look at what we can find in these little squares. 
we have often a number at the top, which we call the atomic number. The atomic number gives us essentially the number of protons that that element has. Now, considering that elements are considered neutral, automatically the number of protons and the number of electrons will be equal because they cancel each other out, making the atom neutral. But really, the atomic number really, really corresponds to the number of protons. And because we know this, we can identify the atom by its atomic number. The protons are trapped in the nucleus. They'll never go anywhere. So if I know how many protons an element has, I can right away determine its identity. Okay, so even if I didn't have the chemical symbol or the name of the element, just from the atomic number, from knowing how many protons uh, a certain atom has, I can identify it because the number of protons is specific to a given element. Okay, so the atomic number gives me the identity of the atom through the number of protons it represents, and because the atom is considered neutral, the protons will be equal to the electrons, so the number will be the same for both. At the bottom, we have the atomic mass. Now, the electron is extremely light, so it does not contribute to the atom's mass, but the protons and neutrons have about the same mass. So when we add them up together, we get the mass of the atom. So this mass, the atomic mass, is the sum of the number of protons and number of neutrons that an atom has. So if we do the exercise based on carbon here, so what we will say is that the atomic number for this particular atom is 6 based on the information in that little square. That means it has six protons, six electrons, because the amounts should be equal. The positives and the negatives cancel out, and that means my atom is neutral. The atomic mass, and we always round the atomic mass. So in this case, the atomic mass is 12, so we drop the 0.01, 12, and that 12 represents the number of protons and neutrons added up together. So if I just want the number of neutrons, essentially what I'm going to do is take the atomic mass minus the atomic number, because this represents the protons, and this represents the protons and the neutrons together. So 12 minus 6, I have, or carbon has in this case, 6 neutrons. Now, if we take a look at a second example, just to make sure that it's clear. So let's say we take, ah, we'll take chlorine over here, okay? Well, that's a perfect example for me. Okay, so chlorine, what is the atomic number of chlorine? And if you want to do this exercise on your own, you can pause the video at this point, fill out the information that you see on the right-hand side of my screen, on a piece of paper, obviously, and then check if your answers are correct. Okay, so the atomic number we see at the top of that square, the number is 17. What does this mean? That means it has 17 protons and 17 electrons, because again, we consider that the atom is neutral. So it should have as many positive um, protons or particles as it has negative particles. Okay, the atomic mass, it says 35.4527. I said we round, okay? So 35, and I just want to make a comment here that I'm using this example purposely. It's equal to 35.4527. Now, if I'm going to round this, when I round, I only look at the first digit that I'm dropping. I'm not turning this into a 5 because this is a 5. And then, but this is a 5, so this is going to turn into a 6. No, 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 no. That's not the way it works. When we round, we just look at the first digit that we're dropping. Forget about the rest. So 35.4 would give me, once I round, would give me 35. Okay, so that's the way you're supposed to round. So the atomic mass is 35. So this is the combination of protons and neutrons. So 35 minus 17, or minus, oops, sorry about that, minus 17 if you prefer, same thing. The number of neutrons should be 18. Now if we go one step further, we can determine how many orbits and valence electrons it has. So number of orbits, chlorine is in row number 3. 
So that means the number of orbits or shells or energy levels is three. And the number of valence electrons, it's in group 7a. So the number of valence electrons is seven. And actually I could have added one more thing. I could have put the family. Now I'm sorry, this is probably not gonna be written very well. Okay, so what would be the name of the family? Group number, number seven is called the halogens. Okay. So if you're not comfortable with this topic, you can take your periodic table and you can pick different elements and do the same exact exercise. Now, do not work using the transition metals. I told you that these over here, so all of these, we don't talk about because their structure is a little bit different. So we can't follow this um, procedure in order to find the proper numbers for these elements. It works a little bit differently. So we're gonna stick to the first two columns, the first two families, and uh, all the non-metals in blue, and you can even work maybe with some of the semi-metals. But if you're gonna practice, stick to the non-metals and these two columns of metals, and you'll be able to apply these rules perfectly. Now, if you're not sure about your numbers, maybe you can verify with a friend to make sure that you uh, did subdivide or, or used information properly. Okay, that's it for today. I hope uh, it helps. If you have questions, as usual, don't be shy and put your, your questions in the comment section below, and it will be my pleasure to help you out. All right, see you around. Have a good one.